Hello space fans, welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, did ESA's ExoMars mission escape disaster? Next-gen Kepler Space Telescope K2 captures an exploding star shockwave for the first time, and the United Launch Alliance resumes supply launches to the International Space Station. All of this on this week's Space Fan News. Do you guys remember a couple of weeks ago I told you about the European Space Agency's mission to Mars known as ExoMars? It consists of the Trace Gas Orbiter to measure methane gas and a lander called Schiaparelli. It launched successfully last week on March 14th and went into a parking orbit around the Earth where it was going to be fired by a powerful fourth stage Russian rocket called Breeze M, which would push the four ton spacecraft out of Earth's orbit and onto its seven month journey to Mars. Well, the way things were supposed to work was the Breeze M rocket was to have a total of four firings to get on its way, then separate, then fire again to send the spent rocket well out of the way of the path to Mars to avoid contaminating the planet as well as staying way out of ExoMars' way. Well, shortly after separation, the probe called home and then ground control at Darmstadt, Germany confirmed that the mission was on a path that would get to Mars. But there were astronomers on the ground at the OASI Observatory in Brazil tracking the spacecraft, and when they looked at it, they saw this cloud of debris following the spacecraft. Here are some frames from the telescope. The ExoMars probe is out of the frame, but you can see at least six big pieces of space junk following behind. So everybody kind of went, hmm, what's that? The Breeze M was supposed to fire twice more after separation to get into a safe disposal orbit, but it looks like something bad happened here, probably during those firings. Now things are a little complicated by the fact that Russia didn't have a tracking station operational when this happened, so to say what happened and what caused this conclusively is very difficult. So apparently, the Breeze M blew up after about ten and a half hours in space when ExoMars was still in the area. But the good news is that ExoMars appears to be undamaged and continues on its way to Mars, albeit training a small cloud of space litter. We'll know more about the status of the spacecraft in a few weeks when the mission scientists start powering up and commissioning the various science instruments on board. And I'll keep you posted. Next, the second generation of the Kepler Space Telescope, called K2, which I told you about last week, has captured for the first time the shockwave of a supernova explosion. Known as a shock breakout, this flash of energy precedes a supernova and lasts only about 20 minutes, so catching this is an investigative milestone for astronomers. An international science team analyzed light captured by Kepler every 30 minutes over a three-year period from 500 distant galaxies searching some 50 trillion stars. They were hunting for signs of massive stellar death explosions, which we all know as supernovae. Now, this all would have happened before Kepler's second reaction wheel failed in 2013, and so it comes from the original data. In 2011, two massive red supergiant stars exploded while in Kepler's view. The first one, KSN 2011a, is nearly 300 times the size of our Sun and 700 million light years from Earth. The second, KSN 2011d, is roughly 500 times the size of our Sun and around 1.2 billion light years away. Now, to put their size in perspective, Earth's orbit around our Sun would fit comfortably within these stars. Astronomers say that in order to see something that happens on a timescale of minutes, like a shock breakout, you want to have a camera continuously monitoring the sky. And why? Well, you don't know when a supernova is going to go off, and Kepler's vigilance allowed us to be able to see this, super, this explosion as it began. So the fact that Kepler was staring continuously at one spot in the sky was instrumental in making this discovery. It really couldn't have been predicted or anticipated. Astronomers needed to be looking at the right place and the right time to get it. Supernovae like these are called Type II, and these begin when the internal furnace of the star runs out of nuclear fuel, causing its core to collapse as gravity takes over. And as you guys know, all heavy elements in the universe come from supernova explosions. Silver, nickel, copper, iron, oxygen, all of it in the Earth, and even the, the molecules in our bodies come from the explosive death throes of stars. It's been said many times, life exists because of supernovae. The research came from something called the Kepler Extragalactic Survey, or K2, 
kegs, something very fun sounding. The team has nearly finished mining data from Kepler's primary mission, which ended in 2013 with the failure of the reaction wheels that helped keep the spacecraft steady. Now, with the reboot of the Kepler spacecraft as K2, the team is now combing through more data, hunting for supernova events in even more galaxies far, far away. I'll let you know. Finally, the United Launch Alliance continues supply fights to the International Space Station. Earlier this week, an Atlas V rocket carrying the OA-6 Cygnus resupply craft launched successfully from the Space Launch Complex 41 in Florida, which was carrying 7,700 pounds of cargo to the astronauts aboard the ISS, as well as some CubeSats that will be deployed after Cygnus separates from the ISS. Now, if you've never heard of these before, CubeSats are this new, innovative program offered to universities and researchers as an inexpensive way to get small packages into space by piggybacking onto the supply launches to the ISS. They are typically 10 centimeters on a side, which is about 4 inches, and they weigh approximately 1.3 kilograms, or about 3 pounds. CubeSats offer a low-cost way to achieve various mission objectives without the need for a dedicated launch vehicle. They're basically miniaturized satellites originally designed for use in conjunction with university education projects. Well, that's it for this week, Space Fans. Thanks again to all SFM Patreon supporters. Look for some new rewards and milestones coming in the coming weeks. And thanks to all of you for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Okay, you know something? I'm gonna I'm thinking about getting rid of the keep looking up tagline. It's it's being way overused by a lot of people. Now I admit I stole it from Jack Horkheimer, who was the star hustler from the nineteen seventies and eighties and who used it all the time. And so I took I grew up watching him, so I took the catchphrase. But now I'm seeing everybody else using it. There's even a hashtag keep looking up, but it's done by some guy on Twitter who has a chainsaw uh, club or something. It's really I don't know what keep looking up has to do with chainsaws, but I want to do another tagline. So do me a favor, guys. Let's let's come up with something new. Tweet at me at SpaceFan News uh, and Give me some ideas on what you think our new tagline should be. I'm not sure yet what it's going to be, but I want to do something that will be deployed after Cygnus separates from the IRS. The IRS. <laughs> Been thinking about taxes.